In March of 2020, I lost my ability to support my family. I work as a public speaker, so when COVID shut everything down, all of my income for the foreseeable future just vanished. Now, there were millions of people losing their income at that time, but knowing that just made me feel even more ashamed for feeling sorry for myself, especially when so many others were losing their lives or their loved ones. I never really felt a threat to my life. This was a threat to my lifestyle. I'm a proud provider for my family, so when I suddenly was no longer able to play that role, I fell into a state of deep despair. So I sat at my kitchen table one morning, just contemplating everything that got me to this moment, and I began to recall all the high points and low points of my life. The high points were my time spent in what I call the green zone, and they included great things like getting into film school, getting engaged, starting a business. Then there were those low points, my time in the red zone. They included things like dropping out of film school because I was diagnosed with cancer having my fiancé end the engagement, and having to close that business. Like everyone, my, seri- my life has been a series of peaks and valleys. Well, that morning, I decided to plot them all on a graph, chronologically. And when I did, I noticed some things that had never occurred to me. The first thing I saw was that after every one of my lowest lows, there immediately followed a highest high, every time. The other thing I noticed is that every one of those highest highs was actually caused by the lowest low. And not because of new opportunities or because of my pivots. What really initiated the jump was the emotion that I went through in the red zone. What I felt is what most influenced what I did. Seeing this for the first time, that was the moment I began to appreciate the importance of pain on our path to resilience. There's a connection between adversity and opportunity, and it's happening all around us. Natural forest fires that are important for the long-term growth of the forest. Economic recessions that are really corrections for market conditions that can't sustain themselves. Even bodybuilders who purposely tear their muscles as they lift the weights, knowing the muscle will heal back stronger and bigger, as you can see. And when they start to feel that painful burn, what does the trainer say? Come on, don't quit, give me two more. They push the bodybuilder deeper into the pain because that's where the workout yields the most benefits. No pain, no gain. Think about how you convert raw dough into bread. To rise, it needs time, but to bake, it needs heat. You don't want it to burn, but for it to become what it's meant to be, it needs some time in the oven. Well, we're not that great about letting our human bread bake. We don't have the patience, and we can't stand the heat. In the gym, it's no pain, no gain. Everywhere else, we avoid pain at all costs, especially when it's someone we love who's suffering. When one of my kids is going through difficult times, my instincts are to dry their tears and slay their dragons. But if I'm doing all that protecting, how much growth in them might I be preventing? And when we can't fix someone's problems, well, that's when we try to fix their feelings, usually with inspirational quotes and cliches that motivational speakers like me have been repeating for years. You've heard this stuff. In fact, here, help me out. Always look on the bright side. Don't worry, be happy. And my favorite, when life throws you a lemon, make lemonade. You ever notice this advice doesn't work? When have you ever been really bummed out and someone said, well, look on the bright side, you're like, oh, yeah, thanks. Like, <laughs> look, like you can just flip a switch and be happy. I no longer believe that just changing your thoughts necessarily facilitates a change in emotion. And by trying to cheer yourself up too soon, you might be depriving yourself of the very pain that could inspire a new idea. And by trying to cheer someone else up, you may actually make them feel worse by giving them feelings about their feelings, making them feel guilty or weak because they can't just turn their frown upside down. I think when someone we love is really suffering, they don't need us to fix their feelings or their problems. Usually what they need is for us to just be there with a hand or a hug or, even better, a casserole. (laughs) You can't go wrong with food. I mean, yeah, some days we need Tony Robbins. Most days, 
we need Baskin Robbins. <laughs> I'll tell you about a time when my parents got this right. I mentioned earlier that my fiance broke up with me, and the next day I had to be in New York for my sister's graduation. I didn't want to ruin the mood by saying anything, so I kept quiet until that night back at the hotel in my parents' hotel room. I sat in their bed and I told them the news, and I just broke down. What I remember about the conversation isn't what my parents said; it's what they didn't say. They never said, "She doesn't deserve you," or "There's other fish in the sea," or every Jewish parent's favorite adage: "This too shall pass." It's not that these things aren't true. They're just not helpful, not in the moment. Instead, my parents just listened and held me and created a safe space for me to feel my feelings, because that's what helps. Think about how do you turn a lemon into lemonade? You sugarcoat it. You cover the sour with sweet. But why must everything we taste, everything we experience, be pleasant? When we're kids. You know, our parents don't tell us to like our vegetables. We don't have to like them to benefit from them. And some of the most beneficial things in our world are not very pleasant. So for me, I guess I feel like a true life well lived is one over a whole spectrum of experiences. Some things lift us up, some things pull us down, but all of them propel us forward. There's the famous Taoist parable about the farmer who has one horse that runs away. But a few days later, comes back with five more horses. But then one of the new horses injures the farmer's son. But that prevents the son from having to go to war. Well, each time one of these things happens, the farmer's neighbor comments on his luck, and each time the farmer has the same reply: "Who knows what's good or bad?" That's not just the farmer's story. That's all of our stories. Certainly has been my story. When I was told I would have to drop out of film school to battle cancer, I thought I was giving up my dream of being a storyteller. Not realizing, a year later, I'd be invited to give a presentation at a conference and share my story. And that one presentation has led to a whole career of motivational speaking and storytelling. But for me to live this dream, I had to go through that nightmare. And when my fiance abruptly ended the engagement, I dropped deep into the red zone. Believing I would never love or be loved again, because I didn't realize that breakup would make me stronger, would make me more mature, and most importantly, would make me available. <laughs> Who knows what's good or bad? The moral of the story is that none of us know how today's experiences are going to influence tomorrow. But the parable doesn't tell us how we're supposed to feel while we wait to find out. I'm aware that my time in the red zone might propel me forward, but I don't have to like the process, because who knows what's good or bad? I do. Getting cancer was bad. Getting dumped was bad. They might have ultimately enhanced my life. It's worth the price I paid, but I'm not happy I had to pay it. And yeah, I understand the power of gratitude, but I also know the difference between authentic positivity and a mind trick rooted in denial. Early in my marriage, my wife and I decided we wanted to adopt. It's a long process, and after waiting many months, we got a phone call. There was a birth mom, nine months pregnant with twin girls, on bed rest at a local hospital. She had just seen our profile and was really eager to meet us. So we buy some flowers. We race to the hospital. She tells us her story, and we tell her ours. We talk. We bond. We even start to make some agreements and some plans. It felt so right. A few hours later, her attorney called and said that after we left, she started crying because she was so relieved that she finally found a couple who she could trust with this sacred responsibility. He said she wanted to sleep on it, but if he were us, he'd start shopping for minivans. So Rachel and I call our parents and we start brainstorming because we're about to go from zero to twins in like hours. It was the most joyful stress I'd ever experienced. 10 a.m. the next morning, the phone rings, and I see on the caller ID it's the attorney. So I scream for Rachel to come in the bedroom so we could answer the phone together. I did not want her to miss the announcement that these babies, our daughters, had just come into the world. Mr. and Mrs. Greenberg, 
our client really enjoyed meeting you yesterday. But after you left, one more couple came in. And in the end, she chose them. Devastation. We had no choice but to get emotionally invested, to begin to love these girls. And just like that, they were ripped away from us. We mourned. It was that experience in the red zone, though, that inspired a new choice to hire our own attorney to help with the search. And within a week, we got another phone call, the meant-to-be phone call. And that would be the first of two children we would adopt, both of whom would send us to the highest heights of the green zone on most days. <laughs> Were they worth the wait? You better believe it. Am I glad we matched with them? Of course. Looking back, am I now grateful that that first birth mom picked the other family? No! <laughs> it was terrible. And I'm not going to rewrite history, pretend that I enjoyed eating my vegetables. I think all of us get to feel our feelings without feeling like we should be feeling something else. Sometimes, though, we drop into the red zone for so long, we lose perspective and we lose hope. And that's when we need outside inspiration. Not to advise us or encourage us, but just to remind us that that jump back to the green zone is even possible. For me, that inspiration was my grandmother. When she was in her 20s living in Poland, Grandma Gina was arrested by the Nazis, put in a labor camp, and then transferred to Auschwitz. From there, she ended up working in a factory for a man named Oskar Schindler made famous by the Steven Spielberg movie. Schindler saved the lives of over 1,200 Jewish concentration camp prisoners, my grandmother being among them. While Grandma Gina survived the Holocaust, she never really escaped it. In the four and a half decades that I knew her, I don't recall one conversation where she didn't talk about what she went through. Even when I was a little kid, I'd be six years old and she'd be babysitting me. Now, at night, at bedtime, most kids are hearing stories about bears and pigs and princesses. My grandmother would talk about her tattoo, the gas chambers, the ovens. Then, as she tucked me in, she would lean over me and say, Scott, at night, when we made it back to our bunks, none of us knew if we would live to see another sunrise. Then she'd kiss me goodnight and leave my room. That was my bedtime story. <laughs> there, there was no moral, there was no lesson. She just wanted me to know. But at six years of age, I understood that her story didn't end in Auschwitz. Her story ended that night at the foot of my bed as my grandmother, an immigrant, a survivor. I don't know how she survived, but for me, the inspiration wasn't about the how. It was just about the hope. Now, did something about the Holocaust enhance Grandma Gina's life? Maybe. Who knows what's good or bad? But I can't imagine anybody who went through that atrocity feeling gratitude. I would never tell my grandmother to look for the silver lining in the Holocaust. For her, I don't think there was one. Sometimes bad things are just bad without any identifiable meaning or benefit. What I can tell you, though, is her surviving that atrocity has made me feel like maybe I can survive my tough times, and for that, I'm grateful. Well, 2020 was, in fact, the worst year of my entire career. 2021 was the best by every measurement. I didn't see it coming, but it absolutely happened and not just because of new opportunities or because of new activities. It all began with the despair that I felt a year earlier and the changes that that inspired. Then in August of that year, my dentist found a white spot in the back of my throat, and a few weeks later, I was diagnosed with tonsil cancer, totally unrelated to the Hodgkin's disease in my 20s. I ended my best year ever back in surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. As an isolated experience, it was brutal. But when I add it to my timeline, and I see it in context 
Well, then I realized it's just part of a pattern. And if that pattern continues, then maybe I have even more to learn and even higher to bounce. I'm not glad it happened, but I'm open to the possibility that maybe I've got good things in my future. Fortunately, the treatment worked, so I'll be around to find out. So, uh, no, no, I, stop, I only get 18 minutes, stop. <laughs> if you find yourself facing difficult times, take some action and ask for help. But also consider changing your question from how can you get out of the red zone to what can you get out of the red zone. And while you search for the answer, give yourself permission to be vulnerable, to be human, and to feel your feelings without feeling like you always need to change your attitude in order to have an increase in altitude. Because that heat, that pain itself, might be the very thing that launches you to your highest heights in the green zone. So the next time life throws you a lemon, eat the lemon. <laughs>